Hello there. So uh, this, this presentation was geared towards more startup founders. And at the same time, I wanted to give you an idea about how I go about investing. And uh, in the room, how many startup founders are working on their products right now? So that's one. How many people are thinking about investing and learning more about investing? That's one, too. OK, so I'm talking about to you guys. Uh, I'm, I, may, I may end up using the same slides, but uh, tell a different story. All right. OK, so uh, let's go. All right. Everybody knows Peter Thiel? He argues if you're going to do a uh, world-class startup, you're going to have to answer these three questions correctly simultaneously. Right? And that means if you were to do that, this is about the framework in within which you can think about. This is the framework that I use as a professional investor to um, invest in seed level startups. Um, I didn't introduce myself. I teach at Boston University Computer Engineering Department Technology Startups. I have a seed fund uh, that invests um, into Turkish and regional companies with the intention of taking them to Silicon Valley. Typically, we invest at a million dollar um, valuation where the, we probably provide the most founder friendly terms in Turkey. So, um, this is the uh, framework that I use to invest. So, this is the framework in within which I take a look at the problem. Yeah? So, um, we're going to talk about programs make something people want. The make something part of the phrase lives there. This is where agile is, lean is, uh, design of experiments, all kinds of tools that you may have heard about. This is not the tough part, it's the easier part. The more difficult part is in figuring out what actually people want. Uh, and they lie about it, that's why the primary problem, th that's where the primary problem is. Paul Graham to do that gives us a very basic, simple algorithm. Find simple solutions for overlooked problems that need to be solved. Get a really crude version in front of your customers. Start iterating very rapidly. Start the conversation with the customer instead of spending time in conferences. That's his argument. Yeah. So we're going to come back to that um, uh, heuristic. So when it says make something people want, the people part, we're not talking about persons. We're talking about customers. Yeah. And really, the pr uh, the premise and the primary pr uh, task of any startup is to create a customer. Meaning, uh, if you create a product, they don't come. If you build it, they, they will come is a lie. Uh, for any new breakthrough startup, the demand for it already lives in the world. All you can do is focus that demand into one product, which will become a startup. Yeah? So then a customer is a demand pattern, a sustainable demand pattern that uh, reached a statistical significance. Like after Airbnb, we all learned that we can demand other and share other assets like that. Airbnb for cars, Airbnb for um, boats, and so forth and so on. So there is a pattern, a demand pattern, that uh, reached the critical mass that we can reuse over and over. So in that sense, customer is not a person, but it's kind of a persona that you can find over and over and over. Yeah? So the first thing that the startup needs to do is uh, build a pers persona. There are a lot of ways to do that. Um, we at the classes and the boot camps teach one way, but um, the takeaway for startups is if you don't do this, you're probably doing your customer um, interviews incorrectly. You need to be able to write down your hypothesis about what this person is and share among yourselves. Now, let's talk about what people want. Um, basically, the best way to find out what people want is to interview them. If you're not interviewing your persona or your customers in the first three months, you're doing it wrong. And interviewing needs to be in person in pairs. Um, a lot of startups do surveys Skype calls, phone calls, that just doesn't count. Because a lot of the stuff that you want to extract from the persona is, is basically non-verbal. A lot of the communication is listening to what they're not saying. All right? So uh, when you're listening to what they're not saying, you want to extract their criteria. When people say they want something, the first reason that they give you is really incorrect. Um, it's a very surface level reason. You know, ask people what, why they buy a watch, 
or a car or a TV or something like that, and they're going to say X. That X is really not the answer. Yeah? Typically, people buy something because, uh, because there are multiple levels of criteria. Right? Typically, this criteria is three to five levels, meaning um, you'll, you'll say, hey, why, 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 why would you buy this? They'll say X. And then why did you, why, what does X give you? They'll, give, they'll tell you something like X2 and X3. After three, four levels, they're going to come to these basic motivations of uh, you know, money, power, freedom, and so forth and so on. All right. So um, you need to get all the criteria until you get that level. It is the second or the third level criteria that really makes interesting products. Right? So uh, to do that, you cannot ask, keep asking why, because it becomes really annoying really fast. So that basically uh, means you're going to have to validate what they're giving you as a reason, because the people don't like to uh, appear that they made decisions for poor reasons, and then kind of move to the next level. Um, founders who can do this actually can extract what people want very rapidly. And then uh, when you look at the patterns, after you speak to like 10 to 20 people and see patterns, um, really the features almost um, mm, sort themselves out. Right? When, you, when, as a, when as a founder you interviewing your uh, persona, your customer persona, the first thing that you need to do is look for a deep story that they tell about a specific experience. Um, meaning a really high quality and valuable, um, valuable interview is like you speak 10% of the time, they speak 90% of the time. Um, most of the things that say relate to a specific experience rather what they imagine or what other, might, other people might imagine, what other people might do. Um, if you cannot get extract that story, probably that interview and therefore that data point is not that valuable. Um, my suggestion to startups is until you find product market fit, and of the 66 here, 20 to 30 don't have product market fit, they will need to get that interview and get that story for at least um, 10 people a week. Yeah. Then this, uh, the task is to consolidate the mid-level things that people say and take a look at the pattern there. Um, at the surface level, it's either um, um, at the surface level, it's either a lie or n something not very valuable. At the very deep level, it is pretty much the same stuff. So um, that means in the middle there is a chunk that is really, really useful. Yeah, because people want the same things at the very deep level. Like um, one third of guys and two third of girls don't like the way they look. Everybody has a fear of rejection and you know, death and uh, old age, everybody wants more money and s freedom and time and so forth and so on. So that level is not useful, but the level before that is extremely useful. Um, that implies uh, founders may want to learn about what all people want, the human universals, uh, because basically you want to subtract that from your product uh, uh, map. Uh, and there are two books here that are really useful for getting that down. Uh, at the surface level, people end up wanting what other people want. We learn how to desire things from other people around us. And uh, Peter Thiel points out that one of his secret weapons is uh, René Girard's argument of how desire spreads, how we learn to s desire things. Therefore, s if you have an emerging, emerging uh, market like here, uh, it would be really, really interesting to know what we're learning to desire from each other right now, and then apply that to localize a product to the local market. Um, the next step is repeat these two until you find a hard, schleppy, unsexy, and frequent and urgent problem. And that is the primary problem, I would say, in Turkey. A lot of startups are working on superficial problems. So overlooked problems actually need to be solved, and we can break this down into multiple chunks. Hard, schleppy, unsexy, frequent, urgent. If a problem that is working on is hard and schleppy, schleppy meaning angaria, and unsexy meaning people just leave that problem alone because it's too hairy, no, nobody wants to solve it, then it is overlooked. All right? uh, if you look at, if you rethink the 66 startups that you see, yeah, a lot of these problems are not hard enough or not schleppy enough. They're really, really easy to solve. So that's one of the first things that I look at the team and 
I compare the team to the problem. For this team, is this the hard, schleppy, unsexy problem that they can solve? If it isn't, they're probably fooling themselves and me. Right? Because we're going on a six to nine year journey, and from the get-go, when they have the maximum energy, they're not solving a hard, schleppy, unsexy problem. That tells me something about the team. Right? If the problem is uh, felt frequently, and, and when it's felt, it requires an urgent solution by the user, then it needs to be solved. Right? So these two components are the first two components I look at when I decide on an investment. Hard part is the trickiest part to get down. For a team, for a world-class engineering team, a hard problem must uh, inc incorporate worry and suspense, meaning the engineering team should be worried a little bit that they may not be able to understand the whole thing and solve it as is. Yeah. They need to be worried about, hey, can we actually deliver this thing? If they feel that they're basically certain that they can deliver it, I don't think it is hard enough. Then that gives me an early signal about you know, how the startup might go. So how do we find these hard, schleppy, unsexy, frequent, urgent problems? I will repeat one point as to Turkish founders. Stop thinking about first world problems. There is a lot of stuff that is broken in Turkey. Yeah. Um, I see this over and over and over again when Turkish founders start working on something really, really superficial while uh, they have tough time finding a rental house. You know, um, Think about the 66 problems that that were dis uh, um, that were displayed here. Probably the hairiest one for Turks in Istanbul is the public transportation, and the guy who's solving it is the Bri British guy. Yeah, there are a lot of Turkish teams that work on things like challenges and hashtags, where the hashtags live and whatnot. Yeah. Tells me a signal about um, where they're going. Um, another two recipes, really good recipes to notice these things, uh, the hard schleppies, is um, go to the edge of the rapidly changing field and take a look at what creates a problem. Because when things shift that rapidly, infrastructure gets broken. Every infrastructure problem is, by definition, a hard, schleppy, unsexy, frequent, urgent problem. Um, another one is go to the slowing mov slowest moving industries. Our first investment is working on furniture industry. The way people buy and sell furniture has not changed for the past 20 years, really, because really it's a really hard problem to solve. Slow mi moving in industry is by definition unsexy. Um, therefore, these problems are overlooked and typically they need a very, very good solution very fast. Right. So um, looking at slow moving industries that did not get hit by technology is a really good, uh, a really good source of finding something uh, where you can deliver something people want. And so finally, when you build a solution, people want the same things over and over again. One is they want simple. Simple in the case of, in the sense of um, architectural things, structural things that are few, and not much ornament. Um, the way to get to simple is to remove, to discriminate. Keep rem removing in an iterative way. Meaning, launch a basic product, take a look at what is what might be unnecessary, and then start experimenting uh, by removing, removing features and counting how many people yell and scream. Yeah? If you remo remove a feature and your users don't care, well, keep doing that. Yeah. I found that very few startups do this, and when they do it, they end up they end up with a very elegant and very simple solution, that is that is really strong at the core and reusable. Right? So that's one uh, that's one way of doing it. Also, people people seem to want timeless, um, timeless in the sense of um, it can it can appeal to this generation or these people or also people like 20, 30 years ago and also to people 20, 30 years into the future. Um, this does not mean, this does not mean um, built for grandpas and hipsters at the same time. But notice that there are, there are lead adapters of technology right now and there were lead adapters of technology 10, 20 years ago. Right? So um, building personas for these different age groups tends to work very well to uh, build something relatively more appealing and timeless. Yeah. Also, another trend that we see is people don't want physical stuff. Uh, fewer stuff and more experiences seems to be 
how the how the world goes now. Um, when I when I was young, stuff was valuable. Like I had few physical toys, and they were very very valuable. I have a 12 year old son. He has a room full of toys, and they're not that valuable. Seems like stuff, the actual atoms, plastic things, just b became so uh, commonplace that now uh, the physical things are um, they're becoming a burden. Yeah. So th people seem to take experiences over physical things. And really, that, that makes a huge argument for software, um, where, where the physical constraints are fewer, it's less regulated, it's, it's, it's um, less expensive to uh, build a product and test it and roll it out. So um, s services over stuff, physical stuff, seems to be another way of getting people want uh, get, uh, getting stuff uh, p that people want faster. So um, here is my prediction about what's going to happen. I think there is going to be there is going to be an integration of human psychology scientifically into design, uh, and the startups that can do this faster are going to be able to make more things that people want, and I think that's going to that's going to yield the next wave of breakthrough products. <laughs>